Now in our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1197 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Two major winter storms, two weeks apart, hit the Northeast U.S., prompting both Aries and Skywarn activations. We will have the details. NASA has announced its future plans to decommission and deorbit the International Space Station. We will tell you where it's going to go. Amateur Radio is challenged by the Tonga Volunteer Emergency Response. We will bring you all the details. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Working Group is working to resolve potential interference to satellite navigation systems. The Dayton Hamvention dinners and special events are announced. WGY Radio 810 in Schenectady, New York celebrates its 100th anniversary of broadcasting. We will take a look back at this historic radio station and a special event station is planned for the event. We will have all the details you need. Research on ancient massive solar storms suggests a need to prepare for the next one. Airline pilots are encountering electronic spoofing of GPS signals. And an Australian radio telescope detects mysterious recurring pulses. We will have all the details coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us about Huawei Technologies in China, who has proposed a new form of internet that is more controllable. And he will tell you about installing a free operating system on an old computer that you may be planning to donate. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, what's in a dream? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at hams at war during World War II, and will explain what WERS, or WERS, the War Emergency Radio Service, was all about. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will discuss the challenges of climbing your tower, then taking a right-hand turn to work out on a sidearm. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our ice-encrusted studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting this week from the sleepy little town of Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in snowy Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio facility in the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're surviving a little bit of ice, a couple inches of snow, and intermittent power interruptions, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Train New York News Bureau, where it seems like the wintry weather has just gotten started, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in the winter wonderland of Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we just received around six or seven inches of snow, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Volunteer radio amateurs across New England got down to business over the final weekend in January as a major winter storm and blizzard dropped up to several feet of snow in the face of hurricane force wind gusts along the coast. The combination of wet snow and damaging winds felled trees and power lines in coastal portions of eastern Massachusetts, particularly in Cape Cod and the islands, and caused minor to moderate coastal flooding at high tide. The record-breaking blizzard made the top 10 list of major snow events in the cities of Boston and Providence. More ice and snow are hitting New England as we come to air on Friday, February 4th. It was a long weekend of Aries and Skywarn operations, with extended Aries operations over Cape Cod and the islands, said Bob Macedo, k 
81 CY. Eastern Massachusetts Amateur Radio Emergency Service Section Emergency Coordinator and National Weather Service Skywarn Coordinator. Western Massachusetts Aries and Skywarn Team supported a Western Massachusetts Emergency Net on 75 meters throughout the event and more than a dozen nets gathered nearly 100 reports on snowfall and weather conditions. Coordinating the operation was Net Manager Tom Kinahan, N1CPE, and his team of net controls with the cooperation of Western Massachusetts Aries Section Emergency Coordinator Bob Meneguzzo, K1YO. The New England Reflector, an internet radio linking project, relayed many Skywarn reports. Close to a dozen repeaters hosted rolling amateur radio Skywarn nets that gathered snowfall and damage reports, as well as current conditions from around the region. Digital mobile radio was utilized for Skywarn efforts, both in southern New England and across portions of Maine. The amateur radio nets provided a tremendous amount of situational awareness regarding snowfall accumulations and the high rate of snowfall that was occurring, storm damage and wind gusts reaching hurricane force gusts across the eastern coast of Massachusetts, Cape Cod and the islands, as well as moderate coastal flooding at the time of high tide, Macedo recounted. More than 115,000 people lost power throughout the southeastern coast of Massachusetts and especially Cape Cod and the islands. In addition, the City of Peabody Emergency Operations Center was staffed by amateur radio operators Jim Palmer, KB1KQW, and David Pays, N1VSI, where North Shore Skywar nets were run periodically and they were prepared to support Aries shelter operations there if needed. Phil McNamara, N1XTB, staffed the town of Carver Shelter for Carver Emergency Management, while various eastern Massachusetts hospitals had their amateur radio teams on standby for support, Macedo explained. Macedo said the information was shared with the National Weather Service, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, and news media to provide an up-to-date situational awareness picture in near real time. Eastern Massachusetts Aries and Skywarn posted a post-blizzard storm summary that includes many National Weather Service record and storm spotter report statements. In addition to rolling Cape Cod Aries and Skywarn nets every two hours, Cape Cod Aries supported operations at the Barnstable County Emergency Operations Center, the Multi-Agency Coordination Center operations at the EOC, and operations at regional shelters in the area. Close to a dozen radio amateurs participated. Cape Cod Aries District Emergency Coordinator Frank O'Laughlin, WQ10, said, We had radio amateurs supporting shelters in Falmouth and a regional shelter at the Barnstable Intermediate School. In Sandwich, Aries volunteers staffed the town EOC as well as two warming centers, while I staffed the county EOC. A key issue we had was various generator failures at some sites that extended shelter operations into late Sunday afternoon before commercial power was restored to the point where operations stood down late Sunday afternoon. New England Skywarn volunteers are keeping an eye on another significant winter storm capable of dumping a wintry mix of precipitation and possibly heavy snowfall around the region on February 4th. They will be prepared to self-activate amateur radio nets for that storm as needed, Macedo said. The Hastings and St. Leonard's Observer, a local UK newspaper, reports that a radio amateur has been convicted of making racial remarks on air. The newspaper said that police confirmed on the 2nd of February that a man from Rye had been convicted of broadcasting racist messages over CB and amateur radio frequencies. John Saxby, aged 61, was convicted of a charge of committing racially aggravated harassment without violence when he appeared at Hastings Magistrates Court on Wednesday, January the 19th. Police said he received a restraining order, a community order, an unpaid work requirement of 80 hours and fines totaling £180. The court heard that between March and June 2021, Saxby made a number of racial remarks over the radio networks. Police said that one victim in particular was targeted by Saxby, who made racial comments and remarks about their disabilities over the course of several months. PC Ryan Welby of Hastings CID said that racism has no place in our society. 
This conviction shows the public that even those who choose to abuse others from behind closed doors will be discovered. We will always treat such reports seriously and act on the evidence presented, he said. This story can be seen at www.hastingsobserver.co.uk and it's understood that the matter has been referred to Ofcom to consider whether this individual's amateur radio license should be revoked. After years of exploring options, NASA has finally decided on how it wants to retire the International Space Station. As detailed in a new statement, the space agency is hoping to keep the aging outpost alive until the end of 2030. After that, it'll make the massive structure plunge towards a remote region of the Pacific Ocean known as Point Nemo. NASA is selling the retirement as a transition of operations to commercial services, reiterating its emphasis on supporting private-public endeavors in Earth's orbit. In an official ISS transition plan sent to Congress, NASA detailed its plans to finally deorbit the ISS. First, Mission Control will power thrusters to slowly lower the station's altitude. Once close to the Earth's atmosphere, around January 2031, it will perform its final maneuver to ensure it lands in the South Pacific Ocean uninhabited area. That Point Nemo area is a popular place for nations to sink their space debris, with countries having dropped more than 263 pieces there since 1971. Not all visiting vehicles can be used to assist in the deorbit, reads the plan. NASA and its partners have evaluated varying quantities of Russian Progress spacecraft and determined that three can accomplish the deorbit. NASA may also make use of Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft to help. The International Space Station is entering its third and most productive decade as a groundbreaking scientific platform in microgravity, said Robin Gatins, director of the International Space Station at NASA, in the statement. We look forward to maximizing these returns from the space station through 2030 while planning for transition to commercial space destinations that will follow. While the ISS may soon be retired, NASA is already looking beyond it to the future. The agency is working with commercial partners to attach docking modules to the station and is also hoping to establish at least one of three commercial space stations with the help of private industry. NASA is also still planning on sending astronauts to the moon well before the station's retirement. Listed under a deep space exploration goal through 2030 in the transition plan, the agency is hoping to use the ISS as an analog for a Mars transit mission. It'll be the sad end to one of the biggest international scientific cooperatives ever undertaken and may well mark the decline of the multination approach to space research and exploration. Both China and Russia, for instance, are hoping to establish their own space stations within the coming years. China, for one, has already sent astronauts to inhabit the first modules in orbit and is planning for its station to be fully operational by the end of the year. For now, scientists will continue their invaluable hard work on board the aging orbital outpost while occasionally filling in the literal cracks that are starting to form in the station's walls. Radio amateurs in the United States and around the world have expressed concern over the situation in the Kingdom of Tonga after a volcano on an uninhabited island in the archipelago erupted on January 14th. The shockwave set off tsunami warnings. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more in this report. A representative of International Amateur Radio Union Region 3 has said that amateur radio in Tonga is difficult as there are currently no HF operators and only a few transceivers in storage. An amateur radio emergency communication network is possible down the road, ARRL has reached out to the IARU Region 3 Emergency Communications representative to offer any assistance. Operators have been asked to keep the IARU Region 3 emergency frequencies clear. They are 3600, 7110, 14300, 18160, and 21360. Amateurs have been asked to maintain a watch on those frequencies for any possible activity that might be related to the volcano. The volcano spewed a huge cloud of electrically charged ash that has disrupted or impaired telecommunications, including satellite and telephone networks. Maritime VHF communication is said to be working. Several Tongan call signs are listed on QRZ.com, but many appear to have been those used for de-expeditions and special events. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Several Tongan call signs are listed on QRZ.com, but many appear to be call signs used for temporary de-expeditions and special events, or are call signs obtained by hams not living in Tonga. The Amateur Radio Club of Tonga, A35HQ, is not active. 
U.S. entrepreneur Elon Musk has offered to send Starlink Internet terminals to Tonga in the wake of the recent events that have left the Pacific Island nation without communication links to the rest of the world. The Radio Society of Great Britain reports that many radio amateurs have expressed concern over the situation in the Kingdom of Tonga after the eruption of the volcano there. The IARU Region 3 representative says that amateur radio in Tonga is difficult as there are currently no HF operators and few transceivers in storage. An emergency communication network may be set up in the amateur radio service in the future. A BBC News report says that New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said it could take more than a month to repair breaks in the 50,000 kilometre cable that serves the South Pacific. The undersea eruption, followed by a tsunami, led to Tonga's 110,000 people being cut off. A 2G wireless connection has been established on the main island using a satellite dish from the University of the South Pacific, but the service is patchy and internet services are running slowly. The undersea fibre, which is operated by Tonga Cable, is believed to have broken about 37 kilometres offshore. According to the Reuters news agency, fault finding conducted by the company in the aftermath of the volcano seems to confirm a cable break. The process of mending it is actually quite simple. A pulse of light from the island and a detecting machine will measure how long it takes to travel, and this will establish where the break is. Then, a cable repair boat will be sent to the location of the first break. It will use either an ROV, a remotely operated underwater vehicle, or a tool known as a grapnel, which is basically a hook on a chain, to retrieve the broken end. That will be rejoined to fresh cable on board the boat, and then the same process will happen at the other end of the break. If all goes well, the whole process will take between five and seven days. But it may take longer to repair, because the specialised repair boat will take a while to get to the islands. The closest one is currently stationed at Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, about 4,700 kilometres away. It's estimated that globally there are about 200 repairs carried out every year. But natural disasters causing them are rare. 90% of breakages come from fishing boat nets or anchors. Data cables are made up of fibre optic strands of glass, but much of the thickness of the cable is just protective casing for the glass strands. Cables that run over a continental shelf have to be buried between 1 and 2 metres deep. However, many just lie on the ocean floor because they're just too deep under the sea for much to damage them. In Western countries, if one cable breaks, it's not a problem because there are many others. The United Kingdom, for example, has about 50 cables feeding data into the country. In Tonga, there was just one. Around the world, it's estimated that there are more than 430 cables spanning a total distance of 1.3 million kilometres. After an earlier cable break in 2019 caused by a ship's anchor, Tonga signed up to a 15-year deal to get satellite connectivity. But the use of satellite phones has been affected by the volcanic ash blanketing the country. And because of the cost, the use of satellite phones is limited to government officials and some businesses. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1, which consists of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Northern Asia, continues wrangling with the issue of interference potential to its Galileo Global Navigation Satellite System sites in Europe from amateur radio operation in the 1240 to 1300 megahertz or the 23 centimeter band. Considerable work has gone into documenting an interference case on a single Galileo channel between a very local Italian 23-centimeter repeater and receivers at the nearby European Commission Joint Research Center in Ispra, where Galileo applications are developed and tested. This one case is often cited as the proof that interference can occur, said Barry Lewis, G4SJH, the chair of IARU Region 1 Spectrum Affairs. As a consequence of this single instance of interference, the IARU has been engaged for several years in defending amateur interests on 23 centimeters. Considerable computer modeling has gone into the effort in advance of World Radio Communication Conference 23.
In 2018, the FCC granted, in part, the European Commission's request for a rules waiver so that non-federal devices in the United States may access specific Galileo signals to augment the U.S. global positioning system. The two systems are interoperable and RF compatible. That order permits access to two Galileo satellite signals, the E1 signal in the 1559 to 1591 MHz portion of the 1559 to 1610 MHz radio navigation satellite service band, and the E5 signal in the 1164 to 1219 MHz portion of the 1164 to 1215 MHz and 1215 to 1240 MHz radio navigation satellite service bands. The order does not grant access to the Galileo E6 signal on 1278.750 MHz in the 1260 to 1300 MHz band, which is not allocated for such services in the U.S., Omitting that channel eliminates any need for U.S. radio amateurs to protect Galileo receivers from interference. The impact of traffic through this very local repeater, 12.5 kilometers distant, on three different Galileo receivers has been documented, Lewis said. This work suggests that while radio navigation satellite service receiver bandwidth can have a part to play in enabling coexistence, beyond that, nothing has been reported that could help develop any coexistence criteria. IARU Region 1 President Don Beatty, G3BJ, stated last year that IARU does not want the amateur service to affect Galileo system operation in any way. Lewis said the IARU has provided extensive information regarding amateur applications in the 1240 to 1300 MHz band, as well as operational characteristics and data indicating the density of active transmitting stations and the busiest periods when these are most likely to be operational. Amateur transmissions virtually anywhere in the band will be co-frequency with the radio navigation satellite service receivers from one system or another, Lewis said. It is therefore obvious that any RNSS receiver will be open to any co-frequency amateur transmission, and amateur operators have no way of knowing where or when a RNSS service user is active. Lewis suggests that some compromises will be necessary to develop a coexistence model. Tickets are now on sale for the 28th Annual Dayton Contest Dinner at the Hope Hotel. The 2022 CQ Contest Hall of Fame inductees will be announced. The dinner is on Saturday, May 21st, starting with a social hour at 5.30 p.m. and dinner to follow. Seating is random and tables are set in rounds of 10. No tickets will be for sale at the door. The tickets are now available for the 32nd Dayton Top Band Dinner as well. That event is scheduled for May 20th at the Hope Hotel. A social hour is from 6 to 9, 6 p.m., with dinner to follow at 7 p.m. The contest Super Suite will take place May 18th through the 21st at the Hope Hotel. It includes four nights of top band, DX, and contesting hospitality. Contest University will take place at the Hope Hotel on May 19th at 7 a.m. until 5 p.m. in association with the Dayton Hamvention. The Southwest Ohio DX Association will sponsor the DX Dinner on Friday, May 20th at the Dayton Marriott at 1414 South Patterson Boulevard. Tickets and details are available. Germany's National Amateur Radio Society, the DARC, reports on a pirate station that was broadcasting in the 3.5 and 7 MHz amateur radio bands. Daniel Müller, Delta Lima 3 Romeo Tango Lima, said that in December 2021 and January 2022, an underground political station appeared on 3500 and 7000 kilohertz. The transmissions took place unusually in upper sideband. The radio program, in Italian and English, was directed against government coronavirus measures. The strong signal was heard across Europe, but the audio was frequently distorted by overmodulation. The Direction Finding Service of the Intruder Monitoring Department at DARC was able to determine the approximate location, whereupon they cooperated with the Federal Network Agency, the BNETSA, to have these transmissions ended. The DARC Direction Finding Team found an approximate location in Italy and informed the German regulator, who in turn contacted their Italian counterparts. 
the B Nets A was able to take measures with their Italian colleagues that ultimately led to the broadcasts being discontinued. At AMSAT's request, NASA has demanifested the Golf T CubeSat from the ELANA 46 mission. ELANA is NASA's educational launch of satellites program. With more details on the now scrub mission, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. ELANA 46 was expected to launch no earlier than 2022. AMSAT said COVID-related restrictions and supply chain disruptions affecting both AMSAT's vendors and team have put AMSAT's ability to meet the mission integration timeline at high risk. Puns aside, the GOLF acronym stands for Greater Orbit Larger Footprint, while the T part stands for Technology Exploration Environment. AMSAT Vice President for Engineering Jerry Buxton and Zero JY said the situation facing AMSAT is similar to what other payloads and space industry providers are experiencing. The worldwide pandemic and supply chain shortages are threatening everyone's ability to properly and successfully deliver for launches, he said. Buxton said out of respect for NASA and the other payloads, it is important to withdraw now rather than later. Golf T and Golf 1 have been selected to participate in NASA's CubeSat Launch Initiative Program, CSLI, and NASA will continue to look for another launch opportunity for Golf T. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. AMSAT says its golf program plays an important role in its return to highly elliptical orbits, in addition to proving the maneuverability capabilities required by current and proposed orbital debris regulations, the GOLF program will work through a series of increasingly capable spacecraft to develop skills and learn systems for which we do not yet have the necessary low-risk experience, AMSAT said. Among these are active attitude control, deployable, steerable solar panels, radiation tolerance for commercial off-the-shelf components in higher orbits, and propulsion. The Golf T mission's goal is to test two critical systems needed for higher orbits. The first is an attitude determination and control system that will allow active pointing and high-gain satellite antennas, providing accurate altitude adjustments in future missions, with maneuverability systems and allowing pointing the fixed solar panel array for best solar power in any given orbit type, AMSAT explained. The second is the Radiation Tolerant Integrated Housekeeping Unit, which will allow AMSAT to gain initial orbit and space radiation exposure for radiation event-induced fault tolerance systems designed using COTS components. Golf T will carry a modified EDIS E310 commercial software-defined radio as an experimental package to test the high-speed data downlink at 10 GHz and a Parrot VX mode linear transponder to provide users with an opportunity to experiment with the 10 GHz microwave downlink. Golf T will also carry a legacy VU linear transponder, AMSAT said. AMSAT says Golf 1 will build on technology and lessons learned from the Golf T mission, but it will be a return to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics-based educational missions, including hosted student radiation and imaging experiments in collaboration with AMSAT's educational partners. Golf 1 will require a more comprehensive deorbiting plan and hardware in compliance with NASA's procedural requirements for limiting orbital debris in order to be manifested on an ELENA launch to the high altitude AMSAT is seeking. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let's talk tech, you and me. We're having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. Let's see what's uh, been going on in the world around us. <laughs> as, as if you didn't know. For instance, I, I think it's really interesting that a lot of uh, different organizations are using the the emergency of the virus to kind of leap on other bandwagons, hoping no one will notice. For instance, China and Huawei proposing something they call new IP, a new internet, a new internet. 
The proposal has caused concerns, <laughs> according to the Financial Times, among Western countries, including the UK, Sweden, and the US, who think that the proposal that China and Huawei made at the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, uh, would splinter the global internet. We, we have a system right now, you're probably familiar with it, TCP, IP, you know, the IP addresses you've heard about over and over again, the because mysterious dotted quads, the four numbers separated by periods, and, and, the, and the whole system of DNS, all that stuff that we talk about, you know, the complicated stuff. That was invented many, many years ago by... Uh, by a guy named Vince Cerf and a, a group of scientists at uh, the Department of Defense at DARPA, at uh, private industry companies like Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, uh, universities like uh, Stanford and MIT, all collaborated to create this thing we use today, 30, 40 years later, we know as the Internet. And it works pretty darn well, if you ask me. It's working real well right now, isn't it? Admittedly, you know, there's some burden on it. People are... Uh, watching a lot more Netflix, so there's a little burden on it, but what would we do? How would we work from home without it? How would we, you know, I mean, it, now you can Netflix and chill. You can't go to the movie theater, but you can Netflix and chill. That's not so bad. I mean, it would be hard to imagine doing what we're doing these days without the internet, but China thinks it's not good enough, and it's interesting because one of the, th the points of new IP is to give according to uh, the, the U.S., the state-run internet service providers granular control over how its citizens use the internet. Oh, China, that's what you want? What a surprise. It has gained the support of Russia. No, no, no surprise there either. And Saudi Arabia. <laughs> what do these three authoritarian regimes have in common? Well, the internet's a threat to them. One of the features... Huawei, the Chinese company Huawei, has built into new IP something described as a shut up command. A shut up command. That means a central point in the network mm -hmm. could cut off communication to or from a particular address. So basically, the internet, the way it works now, in theory, and admittedly, this is what we fight for all the time when we're talking about net neutrality, is an agnostic postman that simply moves moves the data, the boxes, the packets around, doesn't inquire as to what contain what the packet contains or who it's being sent from or to. That's none of its business. Just like in the postal service or the telephone company, it's none of my business. And that's how it should be. That's that's what net neutrality is all about. Packets is packets. No packets are greater than other packets. This system. And you can, you know, as with all of these kind of power grabs, you can always slice it differently to make it sound palatable. Well, how are we supposed to turn off uh, malware command and control servers? How are we supposed to shut up terrorists? How We need a command like this so we can shut down the bad actors on the Internet. And there are plenty. Problem is, uh, the bad actor in this case could be Russia, Saudi Arabia, or the Chinese government deciding they don't like dissidents. And China does this all the time. All the time. Did you see the story that TikTok, which all the kids, I know the kids love it, but you might tell the kids it's, you know, it's a Chinese company. And they had until recently instructed their moderators to eliminate TikToks from poor people, shabby looking people, because, well, that just, that's not good. We don't want to see any poor people on TikTok. That's the kind of control that governments want. They want to keep the riffraff out. And the riffraff might include anybody who doesn't think the government is just super, not super stellar, not sufficiently deferential. The ITU will vote on this. I'm assuming this isn't going to happen. But I just thought I'd mention it. it. It's really interesting how, I mean, I know the bad actors. Yeah, these governments are the bad actors. And I, sometimes I include our own government. They're pushing through something they call the Earn It Act. Bipartisan, you know. Republicans and Democrats both love the Earn It Act because the Earn It Act is, well, think of the kids. The Earn It Act is designed, they say, to protect children against trafficking and abuse on the Internet, which is admittedly a big problem. But the way they're doing it shows they have other motives. The Earn It Act says companies will be liable for any of the content held on those companies sites. So Facebook would be liable for anything you post there. That's traditionally not been the case on the internet. Just like the phone company isn't liable for what you say on the phone. That's not their job to listen in. And for a long time, they call it Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. For a long time, 
internet service providers and still today are protected. You're just a common carrier. You're not responsible because A, it would be impossible and, and B, it, it puts them in the position of having to observe everything that goes on. And that is the secret of the Earn It Act. If you want to be protected, you have to make sure nothing bad is going on. In other words, you have to be able to read the content of every message, just like the phone company have to be able to listen to the content of every phone call. And that means encryption is out. Can't have encryption because if, if I can hide the contents of my Facebook messages or my Apple messages or my WhatsApp messages, if I can encrypt them in such a way that Facebook or Apple can't read them, then they can't do the job the Earn It Act would require them to do. So they have to turn off encryption or more likely break it. Say, well, it's encrypted unless we want to read it, which isn't really encrypted, is it? And I trust Apple and I, well, maybe I don't trust Facebook, but that's not the point. If there's a key, if a key exists, it could leak out and then bad guys could also use that. So this is why the Earn It Act is a sneaky little thing that they're, you know, while everybody's paying attention, look over there. I'm going to sneak that one through, effectively ending end-to-end -end encryption in the U.S. Hmm. Other countries have already done that, including China and Russia. Oh, just we can't, we can't, you know, these these guys will act to take advantage of us as quickly as they can. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Um, and I don't know what you do with those old computers. You know, uh, you can donate them. There are charities uh, like, uh, what was it, the Christina Foundation that will take old computers, recondition them. Uh, usually they'll, you know, wipe the drive, put Linux or something free on there and uh, give it to uh, charitable organizations that need computing power. You know, computers, they, especially, you know, the computer you're buying today with no moving parts, you know, the hard drives will wear out. But the, with nowadays with SSDs, they're not going to wear out for a lot longer than the software will be useful for. This is the problem. You know, uh, the computers, we got... The computers we're buying today, they are very, very powerful. They'll go for a good 10, 15 years uh, without becoming obsolete. But the software gets obsolete, right? So I love the idea of reconditioning, bringing back an old computer to life by putting a modern operating system on it. And I'm not talking Windows and I'm not talking Mac. I'm talking an open source, free operating system like Linux. The reason is... Uh, and Ubuntu is, is, a, is the easiest one to use, especially if you're coming from Windows. It'll be very, very familiar. There, there are, by the way, hundreds of flavors of Linux uh, and for all different kinds of users. You know, there's very geeky Linuxes and there's Linux for novice. Ubuntu is a great kind of choice for anybody who's not used it before. Very easy to use. You install software from a store, just like as you would with Windows or Mac. Uh, with a click of the mouse, it's very straightforward. I think, frankly, the days of uh, proprietary commercial software are fading, believe it or not, maybe for specialized stuff like video editing or photo editing. But uh, for the most part, how are you going to make a word processor better? And the free and open source version of Office, for instance, is as good as Office. How are you going to make Office better? How is Microsoft going to justify that 10 or 15 bucks a month they're charging for Office 365? It's not going to get that much better. It's been done everything you need to do for years, hasn't it? Hasn't it? I mean, what <laughs> what feature is missing? So it, it, uh, open source software has really kind of caught up, in other words. It's kind of what they're, and admittedly, they're building on the foundation that the co private companies like Microsoft and Apple have created, copying in many cases what Microsoft Office can do. But at this point, there's a lot to be said, and, and you don't have to, for you by using free open source software not only free as in it costs nothing more importantly free as in liberty as in free as in no commercial entity can spy on you no government can spy on you uh it's your it's yours you own it and as companies like microsoft and apple and google and facebook and more and more in the mindset that we own you you we don't work for you you work for us you're the product we're, you know, then really that's how they're thinking, isn't it? When Microsoft puts a big blue window up saying, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but you really ought to upgrade to Windows 10, covering everything you're doing, covering the everything you're doing, forcing you, even if you're in the middle of something really important, to pay attention to their ad, that's the time to turn your back on them, I, I say. 
and, and uh, start using software that works for you, not software you, that em- employs you. <laughs> I just think that's wrong. So go, by all means, if you haven't used it before, go try it. It's easy to try uh, Ubuntu. You go to ubuntu.com. A download, you can put it on a USB stick or a CD or a DVD. You can actually try before you buy. You don't have to install it. You just boot to that USB stick or you boot to the CD. Start up your computer by booting not to your internal hard drive, but to that external device. And you'll be able to use it completely. I mean, it's a little slow because it's running off a USB stick, but it's there. And you can see how it works. You can see if you like it. You can try a lot of different versions of Linux that way. Pick one you like. If you're a Mac user and you want something that feels and looks like Mac, there's Elementary OS that is designed to be a Macish Linux experience. Free, open source, free as in money, but but more importantly, free as in liberty. And I think that's that's where computing is going, to be honest. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Less than 24 hours later, the United States was officially at war, and the FCC had issued Order No. 87, which suspended all amateur radio operations in the U.S. and withdrew our frequencies from the amateur service. However, the FCC did recognize that limited amateur operation would be required in connection with domestic civil defense work. Thus, in June 1942, the FCC issued regulations which created the War Emergency Radio Service, or WERS for short. This was not an amateur operation, even though the frequencies used were our former bands at 112 through 116, 224 through 230, and 400 through 401 megacycles. Notice that the 5 meter band, 56 to 60 megacycles, was not included. The FCC apparently sought to limit operations to the UHF frequencies where long-distance skip was impossible. A WERS license was not given to an individual, but rather to a municipality or other local government entity to cover the operation of all such stations engaged in emergency civilian defense communications. Operations could only be conducted upon authorization of the local civil defense corps. Operators in WERS had to be loyal U.S. citizens with the fingerprints and proof of U.S. citizenship on file with the FCC. They also needed to have an FCC commercial or amateur license or an FCC third-class operating certificate. Thus, although most operators were hams, many non-amateurs were active in this service also. Authorized operations in the War Emergency Radio Service were limited to emergencies relating to enemy activity. There was no provision for operations in natural disasters. Practice and training sessions were allowed and local governments may have used these practice activities to provide needed communications during natural disasters. Technical standards were strict for 1942. The carrier frequency could not deviate more than one-tenth of one percent in the lower half of each band and three-tenths of one percent in the upper half. In the two-and-a-half meter band, this meant that the signal could not vary more than 112 kilocycles at the lower end and 340 kilocycles at the upper end. While this sounds incredibly wide today, remember that in the 1930s and 1940s, almost all UHF transmitters used the modulated oscillator, cheap to build, but not very stable. The only receiver useful with this type of signal was the super regenerative. Power was limited to 25 watts input, which meant about 10 to 15 watts output. By default, two and a half meters became the band of choice for WERS operations. In fact, it came to be known as the Civil Defense Band. The most popular radio in WERS operation was the TR-4 by Abbott Instruments of New York City. 
The unit measured only 9 inches by 8 inches by 4.5 inches, ran on 6 volts DC or 110 volts AC, had a range up to 75 miles and cost less than $40. Although WERS served a valuable purpose, it did not satisfy the needs of an active amateur suffering under the wartime radio silence. Fortunately, the World War II amateur had it far better than his World War I predecessor. For one thing, amateurs did not have to disassemble their stations and take down their antennas. Contrary to popular belief, the FCC did not ban shortwave listening. AM broadcasting was still allowed. W1AW was authorized to remain on the air. QST was still published. But even with all of this, the restless amateur wanted more. And believe it or not, some hams legally got on the air and had QSOs. How? Wired Wireless. Have you ever heard of it? In summary, Wired Wireless was a carrier current type of operation. A transmitter, usually running 10 to 25 watts output, was inductively coupled to the AC power line. The signal will follow the power lines throughout the city up to a maximum of about 5 miles. Anyone within 300 feet or so of the AC power line would be able to copy the signal. Even though the range was a 5 mile radius from the transmitter, the actual radiation distance was only 300 feet from the wires. Thus, it was legal. Amateurs found that carrier current operations work best in the long wave spectrum and set up hundreds of stations in the 160 to 200 kilocycle range. Ironically, the 160 to 190 kilocycle segment survives to this day as a legal unlicensed low power band with 1 watt and 50 foot antennas permitted. Some amateurs experimented with audio frequency induction field communications. This involved no RF. An audio oscillator was coupled to a large inductor. At distances of 2,000 to 3,000 feet away, an audio amp coupled to a similar inductor received the signal. QST was active during the war years, running articles on secret communications and ciphers, the latest 112 megacycle WERS equipment, visual signaling including the semaphore alphabet, a course in radio fundamentals, a multi-part series in cryptanalysis, and the Japanese Morris Telegraph Code with notes on the Japanese language. Towards the end of the war, QST ran several articles on post-war amateur allocations. Two columns focused on amateurs serving in the armed forces, in the service, and hams in combat. And, as a grim reminder of the horrors of war, the column Gold Stars listed those amateurs who made the ultimate sacrifice. In our next installment, we will look at amateur life in the post-war world. As a postscript, the ARRL has asked that the 160 through 190 kilohertz band be reallocated to amateur use. Will the ghosts of the World War II operators be listening as we once again activate that band with CQs? You decide. Numerous powerful X-class solar flares occurred last fall as Solar Cycle 25 activity picked up. For a more close-up look at the solar activity, and also a look back in solar history, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report courtesy of the Southgate News Service. In his QST magazine column, John Jones, November Zero Juliet Kilo, pointed out that even more powerful flares than these had taken place in the past, such as the so-called Carrington event in 1859, during which visual aurora was seen in the South Pacific and in Cuba, and it sparked electrical fires. It was called the Carrington event after Richard Carrington, the British astronomer that observed it. Similar events took place in the 20th century, but, as Jones noted, scientists are researching spectacular solar storms that took place as early as 7176 BC and in 5259 BC. Knowledge of the huge solar flare of some 9,200 years ago has convinced researchers that we are not ready for the next one and our modern technology would take a major hit. Jones also said that the Earth may have narrowly dodged a Carrington-level event in 2012. Daniel Baker of the University of Colorado, speaking at the NOAA Space Weather Workshop, said that if it had hit, we would still be picking up the pieces now. Jones said that his reading had led him to conclude that these solar superstorms occur more frequently than people think. As more ice cores and tree rings are sampled, 
Scientists are finding that there have been more of these major solar storms than originally thought. In his column, Jones cited a 2013 Royal Academy of Engineering report that discussed the risks of a Carrington-level event occurring. An extreme space weather event or solar superstorm is one of a number of potentially high-impact but low-probability natural hazards. So said Paul Cannon, chair of the working group that developed the report. Extreme space weather can have impacts on engineering systems and infrastructure. Cannon said that the hazards and risks of extreme space weather on the electricity grid, satellites and air passenger safety had not previously been critically assessed. His group's report attempted to address that omission. Raymond Muschler, a geology researcher at Lund University in Sweden, said that these enormous storms are currently not sufficiently included in risk assessments. It is of the utmost importance to analyse what these events could mean for today's technology and how we can protect ourselves. You can read the full ARRL story at awrl.org forward slash news. Study co-author Raymond Muscheler, a geology researcher at Lund University in Sweden, said, These enormous storms are currently not sufficiently included in risk assessments. It is of the utmost importance to analyze what these events could mean for today's technology and how we can protect ourselves. A Carrington event taking place today could destroy orbiting satellites, disrupt GPS, and damage undersea cables and internet infrastructure on the ground, Jones said in his QST column. An event in 775 AD was believed to have been 100 times stronger than the Carrington event. On Sunday, February 20th, WGY will celebrate its 100th anniversary. Members of the East Greenbush Amateur Radio Association will commemorate the historic radio milestone by running a special event station. When the famed broadcasting facility first went on the air, it was announced that the W stood for wireless, that the G represented the first letter of General Electric, which owned the station, and that the Y stood for the last letter in Schenectady, its city of license. Over the next century, the station would become a leader in both programming and technical innovation. Because of the potential difficulties of setting up a centrally located special event station during winter weather and continued concerns about COVID, members of the club will participate by operating their own home equipment. A special event QSL card from the club will be made available to confirmed contacts and instructions will be posted on the club's website for those who wish to receive one. The special event call sign W7Y has been requested with the number 7 representing G, the seventh letter of the alphabet. Since this station is in This Week in Amateur Radio's own backyard, we thought we would give you a little bit of its history. WGY's original licensee was General Electric, a company headquartered in Schenectady that had extensive experience in radio research and development. In 1903, Reginald Fessenden contracted with GE to help him design and produce a series of high-frequency alternator transmitters. The project was ultimately assigned to Ernst F.W. Alexanderson, who in August 1906 delivered a unit which was successfully used by Fessenden to make radio telephone demonstrations. Alternator radio transmitters became obsolete by the mid-1920s due to advances in vacuum tube technology, and another GE employee, Irving Langmuir, played an important role in this development. GE was a major manufacturer of radio vacuum tubes during World War I and produced over 200,000 for the military during the conflict. Tubes of increasing power ratings were designed, and by the summer of 1922, Langmuir had introduced a 20-kilowatt transmitter tube. WGY actually got its start in early 1915, when GE was granted a Class III experimental license with a call sign 2XI. That license was canceled in 1917 as the United States entered World War I. 2XI was relicensed in 1920. Starting on December 1, 1921, the U.S. Department of Commerce set aside two wavelengths for use by broadcasting stations, 360 meters, or 833 kilocycles, for Class B stations that had quality equipment and programming, and 485 meters, or 619 kilocycles, for market and weather reports. Locally, both WGY and the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute station WHAZ were assigned to this new wavelength on a time-sharing basis. In May 1923, additional broadcasting frequencies were announced and the Schenectady Troy region was given exclusive national use of 790 kilocycles. WGY and WHAZ were assigned to share this new allocation. On November 1, 1927, WHAZ moved to a new frequency, giving WGY full-time use. WGY also used the first condenser microphone, developed by General Electric for radio studio applications on February 7, 1923. 
On February 4th, 1922, GE received its first broadcasting license for a new station located in Schenectady, which was authorized to transmit on the 360 meter entertainment wavelength and was issued the call letters WGY. The original transmitter produced an antenna power of 1500 watts, which was three times the wattage of the standard high-powered station at the time. Unusual for the period, the station's studio and transmitter site were at separate locations. Broadcasts originated from a studio on the fourth floor of Building 36 at the General Electric plant in Schenectady, which was connected to a T-top wire antenna located atop another GE building about one kilometer distant. The station was placed under the oversight of Martin P. Rice, who was the manager of the company's publication bureau. WGY's debut broadcast started at 7.47 p.m. on February 20th, 1922, when Colin Hager, or as he was known on the air, KH, signed on with the station's call letters and explained what they stood for, even though in truth they had been randomly assigned by the Commerce Department. The first broadcast, furnished by some of the city's best talent, lasted about one hour. It consisted of live music and announcements of song titles and other information. The station's second program took place two days later and featured a speech about George Washington, delivered by W.W. W. Tranch, Schenectady's American Legion post commander, followed by a concert. WGY was a pioneer in the use of remote broadcasts originating from locations outside of the main studio, carrying out the first one just days after it signed on. On February 23, 1922, the station ran a telephone line connection to the Union College Gymnasium, where New York Governor Nathan L. Miller and others gave speeches commemorating the 17th anniversary of the Rotary Club. This was followed by a short concert. Other early programming included coverage of the Yale-Harvard football game live from New Haven, Connecticut, the WGY String Orchestra live from the State Theater in Schenectady, and talks and presentations by various GE innovators, explorers, and state and various local officials. A few months after WGY began broadcasting, Edward H. Smith, director of a community theater group in Troy called The Mask, suggested to Colin Hager that WGY carry weekly 40-minute long adaptations of plays. A troupe was formed, known as the WGY Players, performing as radio's first dramatic series. On August 3, 1922, they presented Eugene Walter's 1908 play, The Wolf, the first of 43 dramatizations performed during the 1922-1923 season. Smith also became a pioneer of radio drama sound effects during the first play when he slapped a couple of 2x4 boards together to simulate the slamming of a door. Meanwhile, the WGY orchestra was used to provide music between acts. Response was immediate, with the station reporting that the broadcast resulted in its receiving more than 2,000 letters. In 1923, Guillermo Marconi, credited as the inventor of radio, paid a visit to Schenectady to see WGY's transmitter and studios. In 1924, the transmitter site was moved to its current location in the town of Rotterdam, then known as South Schenectady. This site was also home of GE's experimental shortwave radio stations, W2XAF on 31.48 meters or 9.525 megahertz, and W2XAD on 19 meters or 15 megahertz. WGY's power levels were steadily increased, first to 5,000 watts, then 10,000 watts, then finally to 50,000 watts on July 18, 1925. By 1928, the WGY transmitter was capable of operating at 150,000 watts, and an application was made to increase to this power. However, this was three times the limit allowed by the Federal Radio Commission, and the application was denied. Temporary broadcasts were carried out at the 100 kilowatt power level on August 4, 1927, and at 200 kilowatts on March 9, 1930. From those broadcasts, the stations received reception letters and telegrams from as far away as New Zealand. Plans were to make those power increases permanent, but were never carried out. By 1935, the engineering staff of WGY began to work to replace the T-top antenna system with a single vertical radiator tower. At the time, the station was plagued with signal fading at a distance of 30 to 100 miles from the transmitter site due to cancellation by out-of-phase co-channel signals from the same source. The ideas for this tower were formed from experiments at WJZ in New York. From this, a square, half-wavelength on 790 kilocycles, 625-foot tower was constructed in 1938. The half-wavelength design greatly reduced high-angle radiation, thus solving the close-in fading issues, and this antenna is still in use today. In 1938, the station's studios were moved from Building 36 into a brand new building on River Road in downtown Schenectady. 
These studios were torn down in 1961 to make way for Interstate 890. At that time, the studios were moved to 1400 Balltown Road in Niskayuna, New York, co-locating the station with the GE-owned and operated WRGB-TV. On January 4, 1923, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company made the first network radio broadcast using special telephone lines to relay a program from its New York City station, WEAF, now WFAN, to a Boston station. On June 3, 1923, WGY participated in AT&T's second network test, which linked WEAF to WGY, to KDKA in Pittsburgh, and to KYW in Chicago. The Radio Corporation of America responded by developing a network operation centered on its New York City station, WJZ, now WABC, and in December 1923 made its first test network connection with a hookup to WGY. The WJZ network never advanced beyond a few affiliates and struggled with the low fidelity of relying on Western Union telegraph lines to link stations. In 1926, RCA bought out AT&T's network operations, and WGY affiliated with the newly established WEAF-based NBC Red Network. In the Albany market, WABY, now WAMC, affiliated with the NBC Blue Network, which later became ABC Radio, while WOKO, now WOPG, became a CBS affiliate. WGY remained with NBC Radio until it discontinued operations in 1989. In 1941, the stations on 790 kilocycles, including WGY and KGO in San Francisco, were moved to 810 kilocycles to comply with the North American Regional Broadcasting Agreement. In 1942, during World War II, a concrete wall was built around the base of the transmitter tower to prevent saboteurs from shooting out the base insulator on the tower and taking the station off the air. As the golden age of radio ended, WGY evolved into a full-service, middle-of-the-road format of popular music, news, and talk. It was the flagship station of General Electric's broadcasting group until 1983, when it was sold to Sky Communications and soon after to Empire Radio Partners. General Electric's Schenectady operations also pioneered television by putting WRGB-TV on the air, which signed on as W2XB in 1928. It also pioneered FM broadcasting in 1940 with radio station W2XOY, later WGFM, then WGYFM, and today WRVE. WRVE is credited as the first FM station to broadcast in stereo around the clock. On September 20, 2010, WGY began simulcasting its programming on a 5,600-watt WHRL 103.1 FM. This gave listeners the choice to hear WGY programming on the AM dial or the FM band. Clear Channel changed the call sign on the FM to WGY-FM. It's time for this week's Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington. He reports that our sun was much more active over the past week, with average daily sunspot numbers more than doubling from 39.6 in the previous week to 81.3 in the current January 27th to February 2nd reporting week. Geomagnetic indicator of the average daily planetary A index changed from 8.3 to 10.1, while average middle latitude A indexes were unchanged at 6.4. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux for the near term is 130 and 125 on February 5th and 6th, 120 on February 7th through the 10th, 128 on February 11th through the 12th, 125 on February 13th through the 14th, and 120 on February 15th through the 17th. Looking at the predicted planetary A and dice now, it will be 2018 and 10 from February 5th through the 7th, 5 on February 8th through the 10th, 8 on February 11th, 5 on February 12th through the 16th, and then 10, 12, 8, and 5 on February 17th through the 20th. Time now for the AMSAT report. First Svalbard Q0100 satellite de-expedition will take place April 22nd to the 24th from Cap Linné, he is for radio at 78 degrees north. Three Belgium hams will attempt three days of 24-7 operation via the Qatar Oscar 100 satellite. They will operate two Q0100 satellite stations using the call signs JW0W 
and JW100QO. Another team will use JW0X for HF contacts. With QO100 only 3 degrees above the horizon, Svalbard is at the edge of the satellite footprint. If they're lucky, the operators might be able to contact DP0GVN of the German Antarctic Neumeyer Station 3 for a north-south distance record via QO100. Bob WA8FXQ alerts us to a blog that explains the principles behind GPS and how it works. The blogger, Bartosz Chikanowski, discusses orbital mechanics and the relationship of orbital altitude to signal footprint, among other things, that might be of interest to amateur satellite users. Even if you lack familiarity with the mathematics he uses, you can easily follow the animations. The link is, is a little complicated. C-I-E-C-H-A-N-O-W dot S-K-I forward stroke GPS. The ISS went back to cross-band repeater mode on January 31st. Enjoy the extra FM repeater in the sky. The MSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. February the 13th, 2022 marks the 11th annual celebration of World Radio Day, which is organized by the United Nations UNESCO organization. This year's theme is Radio and Trust, in recognition of radio's standing as one of the most trusted media sources around. Even as various studies reveal a global decline in trust in the internet and social media networks, people continue to see radio as one of the most trustworthy news sources, the organisation said. In a statement, UNESCO said that part of people's trust in radio is due to its low cost and ubiquitous nature. Despite digitization being a global tendency, digital access to information is far from being equal, with huge differences remaining between regions and between communities. Compare that to radio, the organization said, a medium that remains affordable and can be listened to anywhere, even when electricity or connectivity are not reliable. UNESCO said that radio is thereby one of the most popular means of communications, used by an overwhelming majority of people. UNESCO suggested that several themes can be celebrated on World Radio Day, including trust in radio journalism, the accessibility of radio, and the viability of radio stations. The event started in 2011, when member states of UNESCO adopted February the 13th as World Radio Day. February the 13th was the anniversary of the 1946 founding of United Nations Radio. The day is an effort to raise greater awareness of the importance of radio, to encourage decision makers to provide access to information via radio, and to enhance networking and international cooperation amongst broadcasters. You can read more at www.radioworld.com. Here are some news briefs of interest to radio amateurs. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel has tapped Loyan Egal to head the FCC Enforcement Bureau as Acting Chief. Most recently, he served as a Deputy Chief of the Foreign Investment Review Section of the U.S. Department of Justice's National Security Division. He served previously in the FCC Enforcement Bureau. W1AW has received a complete 2-meter FM and VARA FM Windling 2000 system from the Hawaii Emergency Amateur Radio Network, Incorporated. This system will replace the current 2-meter WL2K equipment operating on 145.510 MHz or W1AW-10. The call sign used and frequency will remain the same. The ARRL thanks the Hawaii Emergency Amateur Radio Network for the donation. At KC4USV, located in the McMurdo Basin, Antarctica, contractor and station custodian Christopher Cianfloni, W2RTO, departs on March 1st. A radio amateur and technician will head to Antarctica in February. Cianfloni arrived back on October 5th. The station is a Kenwood TS480SAT, a 400-watt amp, and a 20-meter Yagi at 30 feet. QSL via K7MT or via Logbook of the World. Norway's NRRL has announced its supports for the 3Y0J Bouvet Island de expedition in November 2022. NRRL will allocate 20,000 Norwegian kroners. LA7GIA, LA7THA, and LB1QI are co-leaders of the de expedition 
According to the AMSAT News Service, some new long-distance records are being claimed for contacts using amateur radio satellites. Congratulations to Juan Felipe, A65GC, and Jerome, F4DXV, for their QSO on HO113, made on the 13th of January between the United Arab Emirates and France. Their contact at 1952 UTC reportedly spanned a distance of 5,298 kilometers, or nearly 3,300 miles. Jerome, F4DXV, also reported a contact with Sergei, ES4RM, which would be a new record for AO109. That contact between Estonia and France on the 22nd of December last year, they believed covered 2,445 kilometers, or 1,500 miles, setting a new record for that satellite. If you're excited about attending Hamcation in Orlando, Florida this month, and just as excited about the World Radio Sport Team Championships next year in Bologna, Italy, here's a way to combine the two events. Be sure to look for organizers of the WRTC. WRTC organizers said they're happy to be finally making the trip after two long years. WRTC organizers Claudio, I4VEQ, and Fabio, I4UFH, will be making a presentation at Contest University on February 10th at the Double Tree by Hilton Hotel Orlando at SeaWorld and will be attending Hamcation, which runs through February 13th. And finally, special event call sign N2I will be on the air on February 12th from the Edison Center Museum in New Jersey with members of the New Jersey Emergency Communications Team operating on 80, 30, and 20 meters, various frequencies and modes. N2I commemorates National Inventors Day. Menlo Park, New Jersey was the site of Thomas Edison's laboratory. Foundations of Amateur Radio on the 6th of June 2004, two Brazilian amateurs, Roland, Papa Yankee 4, Zulu Bravo Zulu, and Arnaldo, Papa Yankee 4, Bravo Lima, made a historic contact on 40 metres. The distance was not particularly significant, only 70 kilometres, but the mode was using 2.1 kilohertz bandwidth so it could fit within an amateur radio SSB transmission. They used software created by Swiss amateur Francesco Hotel Bravo 9 Tango Lima Kilo to make the very first ham dream exchange. This technological advancement represents the birth of what we now call ham DRM and digital SSTV. And how it came about is an adventure that needs documenting, since what we have is written in a combination of Portuguese, German and English, cobbled together from broken websites, archives, source code, commit comments and lost links. To provide some context, there is a broadcast radio mode called DRM, or Digital Radio Mondial. At this point I should mention that this has absolutely nothing to do with digital rights management, with the catchy acronym of, you guessed it, DRM. As you might expect, this acronym clash is unhelpful, to say the least, when you're trying to find information about this radio mode. Digital Radio Mondial, or DRM, essentially defines a digital standard for radio broadcast transmissions. It can handle multiple audio streams as well as file exchange, and is used by broadcasters across the globe. Mondial, in case you're curious, means worldwide in French. Seems my high school language lessons have finally been put to good use. My French teacher in the Netherlands will be thrilled. DRM is more efficient than AM and FM, and as an open standard it's gaining popularity. The first broadcast using this mode took place on the 16th of June 2003, during the World Radio Communication Conference in Geneva. An open source implementation of this mode is called DREAM. The source code is available online and is capable of being compiled for Windows, Mac OS and Linux. DREAM was originally written by Volker Fischer and Alexander Kurpiers. The DREAM project started in June of 2001, and today it has many contributors. The DRM standard uses different bandwidths depending on which mode is used. The narrowest DRM mode uses 4.5 kHz, but modes using 100 kHz exist. By comparison, a typical analog amateur radio uses 2.7 kHz for SSB. 
Using the source of Dream, Francesco built a modified version, called it Ham Dream, and let it loose on the world. It was used for that very first 70km contact between Roland and Arnaldo. Several versions of Ham Dream existed. The first QSO used 2.1kHz and the last version of Ham Dream used 2.5kHz bandwidth. To fit digital audio inside that narrow bandwidth, it used different audio compression techniques called a codec, namely LPC-10 and Speaks. According to Francesco, Ham Dream is the basis for all current amateur radio 2.5 kHz ham DRM programs. He goes on to say that it's outdated, and the source and executables were removed from the net. Personally, I think that's a shame, since it represents part of the history of our community, and I think that putting the source online in a place like GitHub would be beneficial to the hobby. The 2.5 kHz ham DRM mode is implemented in several places. QSSTV, EasyPal, and WinDRM, to name a few. No doubt it's elsewhere. Of those three, only QSSTV survives. The source code for EasyPal, written by Eric, Victor Kilo 4 Alpha Echo Sierra, now Silent Key, was lost, apparently when the computer on which it lived was sold by his estate. Ironic, really, since EasyPal was written because Eric lost a previous application due to a lightning strike nearby and was forced to write a new application from scratch. WinDRM appears even more elusive. There's a repository on the now archived Google Code site. There are derivatives that appear to use a version of WinDRM, but details are hard to find. An archive I have shows a commit by Francesco Hotel Bravo 9 Tango Lima Kilo from 2008. I've yet to learn how this relates to the overall picture. In parallel, in 2005, a few enterprising students made a MATLAB implementation of DRM, called Diorama, and written by Andreas Dietrich and Torsten Schor. It forms the basis of a Linux open source ham DRM receiver, written by Thies, Papa Alpha Zero, Mike Bravo Oscar, chosen because it had a better performance in marginal conditions than Dream did. It's called RX AMA DRM. TIS also wrote an open source transmitter, cunningly called TX AMA DRM. It was based on the source code of Dream, specifically version 1.12b. If at this point your head is exploding, I wouldn't blame you. Let's recap. There's an open broadcast standard called DRM, an open source cross-platform tool called Dream in active development implements that standard. A special, now discontinued version of Dream was created called Ham Dream. It uses less bandwidth than DRM and forms the basis of a standard that we now call Ham DRM, which underpins digital SSTV. Ham Dream forms the basis of discontinued products EasyPal and WinDRM and lives on in TRX, AMA DRM and QSSTV, both Linux open source. In amateur radio terms, ham DRM is one of the ways we can efficiently exchange digital information across long distances. At this point, you might wonder why it matters. For starters, this is part of our history of amateur radio. The ham DRM mode is poorly documented, if at all. It forms the basis of several modes in use today, and writing your own software is made all the more challenging because much of the design and development of this mode has been lost. What's more, ham DRM is an example of modern radio. It uses the same fundamental techniques used by the 4G and 5G mobile phone network, as well as modern Wi-Fi. Losing this is a massive step backwards for amateur radio. This article alone represents a week of research by two people. Thank you, Randall, Victor Kilo 6 Whiskey Romeo. And I won't be surprised to learn that it contains errors and omissions. It shouldn't have to be this hard to discover how a mode works, what is used to make it tick, and how to write new software to implement a new application. Gotta love open source. Speaking of which, if you have source code copies of Ham Dream or WinDRM, I'd love to hear from you. CQ at VK6FLAB.com is my address. If you have documentation on the design of the Ham DRM mode, I'll owe you a beer or a glass of milk, your choice. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The ARRL is seeking three qualified candidates to serve on its Investment Management Committee. 
Selected individuals will be part of a six-member team to provide oversight of ARRL's external investment manager and to advise ARRL's administration and finance committee and the board of directors on investment policies and portfolio management. It is expected that committee members will meet quarterly with one or two meetings in person and the remaining meetings via video conference. Terms of office are to be five years. However, qualified candidates will be the initial committee members and the initial terms will be one, two, three, four, and five years to create an appropriate staggered term structure. Applicants should have the following qualifications. Hold a current amateur radio license and be a continuous full member of ARRL for at least four years. Have significant investment-related experience on the buy side, sell side, or preferably both. Have past and or current employment managing or overseeing portfolios or budgets in excess of $10 million. Hold a degree in business or have equivalent experience in finance or investments. Preference will be given to those who have worked in the financial services industry and or managed investment portfolios. These positions are unpaid. However, necessary expenses, including travel to meetings, are reimbursable. A committee has been established to recommend three candidates to the president. Qualified members are invited to submit a statement of interest and qualifications via email to imc-candidates at arrl.org. The deadline to submit is April 15, 2022. Belgium's National Amateur Radio Society, the UBA, is asking its members for input for the International Amateur Radio Union Interim Conference, which is planned for June. Every three years in non-pandemic times, there's an IARU conference of all the countries from Europe, Africa and parts of Asia that make up IARU Region 1. One year in advance, the HF, VHF and EMC managers come together at a meeting in Vienna. This enables them to prepare properly for the full conference that would normally take place the following year. This time, it's been decided to have these managers meet in Friedrichshafen in June of 2022. This is, of course, subject to the further evolution of the coronavirus situation. The agenda of the interim conference is partly determined by the proposals that the various IARU Region 1 associations place on the agenda. These proposals will then be discussed in the three working groups, HF, VHF and EMC. The UBA says that input from its members is desirable. If members have a proposal that fits with the framework of one of these three working groups, UBA would like to hear from them. However, there is a strict deadline. Since all proposals must be submitted for the main meeting next January, contributions must reach UBA by the 1st of March 2022 at the latest. This gives the various UBA committees a chance to look at the proposals and the Board of Directors can discuss them at its last meeting of 2022. Radio interference that has created electronic spoofing of signals on the global positioning system is reported to be interfering with aircraft attempting to land at Israel's Ben-Gurion airport, according to several news outlets. The Times of Israel reports that the signals are coming from defense systems installed in Syria by Russia, and they're having an impact on commercial airliners. State-owned Israeli TV station KAN said that Moscow has told Israel the signals are part of a defense system designed to protect Russian soldiers in Syria. A pilot told the KAN news outlet that the signals during the last four weeks have been as strong as those experienced in early 2019. The pilot said that, however, those earlier signals eventually stopped. He also told the station, What we've run into is electromagnetic spectrum interference from the east, which has taken us a while to understand what it is. Reports said the officials believe the interference with commercial planes is collateral damage and the jamming is directed elsewhere. Just weeks after hams in the UK began operating with a special call sign marking the 100th anniversary of the British Broadcasting Corporation, similar on-the-air festivities are taking place in Australia. Ham radio operators in Australia are using the call sign VK90ABC to mark the 90-year anniversary of their Australian Broadcasting Corporation. It's a nod to that memorable moment when the nation's airwaves came alive on the 23rd of November in 1923, 
with Australia's first licensed public radio broadcast, which featured the St. Andrews Choir. All amateur radio operators throughout Australia will be eligible to use the call sign, but must apply for it first through an email to info at vk90abc.net. According to the call sign's QRZ page, there will be no QSLs sent direct or by the Bureau. Contacts are to be confirmed via Logbook of the World or eQSL with logs uploaded once a month. Meanwhile, there's a lot of history in the logs of the log cabin in Lerna, Illinois, home of the Lincoln Log Cabin State Historic Site. The cabin was home to Thomas Lincoln and Sarah Bush Lincoln, father and stepmother of Abraham Lincoln, the lawyer who was to become the 16th president of the United States. The National Trail Amateur Radio Club is marking Lincoln's February birthday by putting two call signs on the air between February 7th and 13th. Be listening for K9L, which will be used by members operating from their home, QTH, and W9L, which will be used at the historic site itself. There will be commemorative QSL cards for successful contacts on all bands and all modes. The 86-acre historic site is no stranger to important moments in history, and this amateur radio event expects to be one of them. To learn more about how to get in the log, visit the QRZ page for either call sign. On Thursday, February 18th at 0100, the evening of February 17th in North American time zones, the U.S. Army Network Enterprise Technology Command, or NETCOM, will host a Zoom call to discuss amateur radio and AUXCOM support to the U.S. Department of Defense. Get ready to copy the information for this Zoom call. During this presentation, the NETCOM representative will discuss the authorities for these operations, upcoming DOD exercise opportunities for 2022, where outreach to the amateur radio AUXCOM community will be a primary training objective, use of the five 60-meter channels, the concept for the types of amateur AUXCOM outreach. There will be an opportunity for Q&A throughout the presentation. Use this Zoom link to attend. The meeting ID is 837-8115 four six one five and the passcode is six seven zero six six five again the meeting id is eight three seven eight one one five four six one five and the passcode is six seven zero six six five the ARRL Foundation Grant Program is accepting proposals until February 28th. Interested organizations can find more information, including eligibility criteria and guidelines, on the Grant Program webpage. A reminder that this is not the club grant program that was recently announced from Amateur Radio Digital Communications. All proposals will be reviewed by the Foundation Grant Committee at the close of the cycle. Once the committee agrees on the proposals to award, they will be sent to the full foundation board for a formal vote. Awardees will be notified approximately one month after the closing of the cycle. Members of a new panel designed to make amateur radio more accessible for beginners in Japan held their first meeting on January 26th. The Amateur Radio Advisory Board for Wireless Human Resource Development was created by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. One of its members is Yoshinori Takao, JG1KTC, the president of the Japan Amateur Radio League. According to a press release on the ministry's website, the goals include fostering experimentation and research in amateur radio and making activities more accessible for newcomers, especially the very young. The creation of the panel follows efforts during the past few years by Yoshinori and the Japan Amateur Radio League. Working in cooperation with the Japan Amateur Radio Development Association, the JARL pressed the ministry two years ago to find more opportunities for elementary and junior high school students to learn about amateur radio. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. 
The only thing that worries me more than climbing to 400 feet on a July night with thunderstorms visible in the distance is climbing to 200 feet and then making a turn to the right and moving away from the tower six feet on a sidearm. Just the thought of making a sharp turn on a highway with no exits just doesn't seem natural. But for a climber, it's a necessary part of the job. For the safety-oriented climber, we work to minimize the risk of death. Let's be honest here. If something goes very wrong on a sidearm, one of three things will happen. Death, poopy diapers, or serious injury. Let's examine some potential truths about sidearms. For openers, if the sidearm was about to fall off the tower, it would be visibly obvious just by looking at its mounting hardware most of the time. Also, if that structure survived the past year's worth of ice storms, 90 mile an hour winds, or worse without breaking, Chances are, it'll support my fat butt for a short amount of time, just fine too. Since tower climbers usually own lots of straps, belts, and ropes, we have the ability to choose how we want to protect ourselves when working on sidearms. Basically, we can choose to secure ourselves to the tower, or if we want to secure ourselves to the sidearm at all. Depending upon the width of the tower, the design of the sidearm will vary. On a one to two foot sidearm, Many times I stay below it and stay strapped to the tower. I use two or three devices and lean out away from the tower so I'm just below the antenna I'm working on. If the antenna is too heavy to handle this way, I can secure it from above or work on it from above. If the sidearm is a big six foot mother, I prefer to climb out onto it to get my work done. What I do is use a very light but very strong rescue strap. It's about 10 feet long and strong enough to pull a car out of a ditch, yet light enough to carry in a big pocket. I attach it with two beaners about 5 feet above the sidearm on that side of the tower. The other end of the strap goes to my belt. I slide out onto the sidearm and often never strap onto it. Depending upon the width of the sidearm and the weight of the antenna I'm working on, I may never strap onto the sidearm at all. This way, if the sidearm breaks off the tower, I'll drop to the end of the strap and stop while the sidearm can fall away. If I was strapped to the sidearm too, my strap would have to catch all of that weight, which sounds like a bad idea to me. Again, each installation is different. One needs to know the age of the structure and look how well maintained it is and decide how to deal with safety based on a first-hand inspection of the sidearm. There is not much in nature that would put an equivalent weight load at the end of a sidearm equal to my 160 pound body weight. So a climber needs to be very aware of the risks and safety specs of his gear, not to mention the condition of the tower. The professional climber recognizes the danger and works to minimize the risk without losing lots of time and with minimal added weight. If you want to imagine a job I don't ever want is the guy that slides down the guy wires with the bucket of grease smearing a coating from end to end. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, a radio telescope in Western Australia has been picking up highly polarized signals and a repeating series of pulses, suggesting that the bright object, which appears to be its source, possesses a strong magnetic field. The scientists at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research are detecting the radio waves at a rate of three times an hour. An astrophysicist at Curtin University believes this might be a magnetar, something that only exists in theory until recently. Researchers have known about the bright object since it was first seen in March of 2018. The more than 4,000 low-frequency antennas of the Murchison Wide Field Array are picking up transmissions which originate some 4,000 light-years away from Earth. Curtin University astrophysicist Natasha Hurley-Walker has stated that no, this isn't coming from aliens. To solve the mystery, researchers at the Posse Supercomputing Center in Perth will be exploring data from similar pulsing objects to compare to this one. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. 
the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guide, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the Internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154.